strategy for anybody like John. <clears throat> oh, in yes. Thanks, Brian. So we just have to say, got it, don't we? Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Um, uh, so that'll give John a chance to catch up when he's finished his cat hearing. And uh, Ralph Jacobson is the other one in the UK. He's um, uh, unable to be with us today, but he's very keen to see the recording. So we'll make sure we send him the link to that too. Um, any other apologies? No. Uh, no, a couple of announcements. Um, uh, next meeting in May is with Alan. Yay. Alan Hodgson is right here. He's going to tell us all about his time and space and the philosophy that he's developing around that. Alan, do you want to give a few more uh, interested and uh, sort of in inviting words? Sure. Um, uh, basically, it's all about my journey to define what my photography is going to be into the future. Um, yeah. I've had a working life in photography and I need to do something different. And time and space is just a, uh, a little phrase that sums up the philosophy that's starting to develop that will guide me into the future. So do I'm looking forward to it and talking to you about so it all. Very much. Yes. Right. Now that's on Wednesday, the twenty second um, of May. Uh, again, the same time in the evening Australian time. Do watch the the clocks because they'll be going differently between now and then. It'll be a instead of an eleven hour difference, there'll be a nine hour difference between the UK and yep. the Eastern States. Um, another uh, an sort of announcement. Robin and Gigi have just mentioned that there's a very good exhibition by Steve McCurry on in Williamstown. And I think it'd be useful if anybody else in Melbourne uh, knows about that. Um, Pass the word. Uh, it really is very good. I don't think it's on that Where far, about in is it? Is this on in Melbourne? Yeah, yeah. I think it was in Sydney first. It, it was in Sydney, Brian. I think it yeah. came to Melbourne from Sydney. So I don't think They've very, you know, that they've advertised it terribly well. But well, it, it's that. also, I mean, it's interesting because um, we've got that online talk coming mm -hmm. up with our president and Steve McCurry, uh, you know, a, 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 a chat, weeks, a talk oh, in wow. a couple, or maybe even in a yeah. week's time. I can't remember, but it's coming oh. up soon, isn't it? There's yeah. a there's a I Zoom thing uh, mm. with the president and Steve McCurry talking about his life um and you know it's just a great exhibition as i say it's really it's hung well it's a great selection of work the lighting um, is incredible and the lighting is just superb. perfect and it's, it it's really well worth mm. yeah just mm. pass the word anyone you know yeah. that's i mean you don't especially have to be interested in photojournalism they're, they're just great pictures mm. you know mm. but ev Which everyone knows, knows it, well, it's, it's not in a gallery. Works. I think it's called Sea Works. Yeah, it's not in a gallery. It's in an okay. old marine boat shed, enormous boat shed called Sea Works. Uh, you know, on the Esplanade at Williamstown. Yes. And ah. what they've done is they've black draped it all the way around inside, oh. and then you know put all the panels in, dropped in all the panels for the exhibition. So it's it's very mm. well. It's good. It's good. Mm -hmm. I won't issue any spoilers, but you know there are some. There's some terrific work, and there's some terrifying work from mm -hmm. from his days in Afghanistan when he was covering oh, Afghanistan. Yes. Well, we'll put a mention of that in the forthcoming newsletter, perhaps. And uh, that. Yeah, I'm not sure. Just we, check the date. Check the date, Rob. When I'm not yeah. sure when it closes. So I think it might be the end yeah. of April or something. Yeah. Like that, so. Yeah. Okay. We'll do. Right. Well, that sounds great. Any other announcements or notices people would like to give? I could mention, must mention, Robin's own exhibition down at Foster at, yeah. called Tweet, uh, and it's called uh, Bird, uh, oh. Flight. Birds of Sorrow, <laughs> Birds of Flight, Birds of Sorrow. No, that's not quite right. Flights. Of beauty. Flights, flights of beauty. Flights of beauty, Flights of Sorrow. Flights of Sorrow, yeah. Would you like to just give us a couple of words about it? Oh, um, well, it's, um, I think the, uh, Rob did a little piece in the newsletter, I think, hmm. last year when I was working on it. So it's a, it's basically a project about um, 
climate change and the reduction in biodiversity and the uh, species loss. And so it's looking at um, Australian species that you know have either been lost altogether, gone extinct, uh, or are now endangered or threatened, you know, and so on. Um, but in, I, I tell that story through extreme macro photography of their feathers rather than sort of scraggy old, uh, you know, birds that were made extinct 60 years ago. But, you know, I've honed right in on their feathers so you can, you know, you get a sense of that beauty, but you also get a sense of the sadness that uh, these have gone, you know. So that's that's what I've been with. I, I worked at the Museum of Victoria for about a year. So I did about 5,000 photographs, um, several hundred species, all, mm. all using scano, um, scanning macro photography. To, so you get these enormous great prints that are absolutely pin sharp all the way through the, the feathers. So. It's it's on it's our fun. website if anyone wants to have a look. Mm. So mm. they can have a look yeah, on the website. Really beautiful, and but it, but it comes up better as yeah, big prints. It it's very much in your face print. as yeah. a big print, you know. Mm. Oh, absolutely superb! It's down at Foster in uh, country South Gippsland. If anybody's heading down that way, okay. Well, we better get on with the main event of this evening. Yeah, and we're, of course, it's we're running late now. Robin, <laughs> continuing to tell us. Well, I have to cut it short. <laughs> <laughs> but as we know, uh, Robin and Gigi are both fantastic photographers. Uh, they started off as uh, professional medical photographers, but uh, right, I think photography has been a central part of their lives, not only through work, but through leisure and now in retirement. Um, as most of us know they've also been hugely supportive of the chapter and we've had a number of meetings where they've either given presentations or had made their home available for other speakers and that's been deeply appreciated. Uh, now, as well as the, uh, the oh, yes, not as well as, in addition to that wonderful uh, research work that they've done in medical photography, they've also had many awards from many different parts of uh, different photographic and other organisations. I'm thinking particularly of those garden images that you, um, it was a couple of years ago, wasn't it? Or several years yeah. in succession, we uh, yeah. both have, uh, had a very high uh, awards granted for the yeah. uh, recognition of what, Garden Photographer of the Year, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, International Garden yeah. Photographer of the Year, which is mm. a bit of a misnomer because... It has all sorts of sections on, you know, landscape, the impact of, of climate and all sorts of things. So it's not it's not just mm. tulips in your backyard. No. <laughs> but with the theme of photography having been so constant through their lives, we are now very privileged to hear them tonight talking about how they've coped around the world in so many different weather conditions, adverse and otherwise. And singing in the rain, here we are. Okay. So over to you both. <laughs> Thanks, Elaine. Um, now, what do we do now, Rob? Are you um, okay? So um, share the screen. Okay. This always. Uh, share screen. Okay. So I'm about to do that. I'm sharing the screen. You're right. You're sorted on that. Good. Yep. Okay. Yeah, we're singing. And in now I just need ah. to go into. Uh, present of you. That's it. We get in there. Hang on a sec. Uh, while you're getting there, I'll just let you know that Steve McCurry is on till the 20th of April. Oh, yeah. okay, well, great. It's still a few weeks. That's so still it's a definitely week. worth doing. Hats going. It's... Buy tickets online, yeah. yeah. Seriously. Okay. You. Seriously worth a go. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, let's um let's get underway. Get your umbrellas out, everyone. I'm seeing Singing in the rain, what a glorious feel, and I'm happy again. I'm laughing at clouds, so dark up above. Well, that's just a little tribute there to uh, Gene Kelly and the title of our talk, Singing in the Rain. 
I when I was uh, uh, getting that little video clip, I noticed it was uh, released on my birthday in 1952. Oh, so oh. there we go. <laughs> um, well, we love photographing in spring and autumn. Uh, the light is better. The golden hours are at a reasonable time. You don't have to get up at silly o'clock. Uh, wildlife, generally speaking, is quite active. And the colours are brilliant. And generally speaking, there are fewer people uh, around. But of course, spring and autumn have the heaviest rainfall, generally. And we usually manage to find it. From Boston to Barra, Dublin to Dubrovnik, from Ireland to Italy, Cornwall to Connecticut, even the Australian outback, we've experienced torrential rain all around the world. Sometimes weeks of photography have been compromised by appalling weather conditions. So much so that we've often contemplated setting up in business as rainmakers. You know, <laughs> just get Robin and Gigi to come along and you're, you're guaranteed, uh, guaranteed rain. Uh, Robin, can I just interrupt? Um, yeah. We're seeing your uh, uh, next slides and your, your words there. Oh, okay. We're ah, wrong. okay. We're, might, sharing, might, the, wrong we, thing. we're wrong. sharing the wrong screen. It might need a full screen. So, thank you for telling us. Thank just you. Okay. Let's, Let's do it again. just do that again then. Hang okay. on a second. Share the screen. And you want? Let's see if this works. You tell us if this I works. I think you. I think you want this one. Let's yeah, try. Let's try right. this, Rob. Looking good. Is that good. looking better? Okay. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Can you Excellent. see the pictures? Yeah. All right. Yeah, it's always Excellent. hard because yep. yep. a lot of these pictures involve rain, and of course, yep. by definition, it's quite tiny. So let's hope it works. All right. So yeah, even Death Valley, hottest driest place on earth with temperatures reaching 56 degrees centigrade and guess what when we were there it poured with rain so this is what a typical that's a typical drive in the country for us so the moral of this story, by the way, is never go away with the Williamses because, uh, you know, unless you love uh, getting wet, of course, in which case you're probably guaranteed it. Mm -hmm. So it can be, you know, very difficult finding motivation to get out when rain is forecast. But unlike the carpenters, we've learned to embrace rainy days and to make the best of soggy landscapes. So tonight we're going to share with you some of our strategies and techniques for coping with adverse weather and even hopefully turning them into terrific imaging opportunities. As you know, the great god Kodak of photography always recommended taking photographs with the sun over your shoulder. But, you know, that it's, that's just not possible or even desirable, really. So based on our experiences, we're going to talk to you tonight about uh, three main topics, strategies for dealing with uh, rainy weather, keeping yourself and your gear dry, and then lastly, subjects and techniques that are suited to photography in the rain. And we'll illustrate this throughout with um, some examples of our own photography, which we hope you'll enjoy. So we believe there are five ways to deal with that pesky precipitation. You can change locations in search of, of better uh, weather. You can abandon the location and come back another day. Or you can just get out there and make the best of it, taking cover and sitting it out as appropriate. So let's look at the pros and cons of each of these. So here we are in the English Lake District at Westwater southwest of Scarfell. And of course, it's pouring with rain. We're there. <laughs> so with a bit of local knowledge and some understanding of weather patterns and a large dose of optimism, we headed off on the 90-minute drive round to the other side of the Scarfell range, where, goodness me, Great Langdale is bathed in beautiful light. So how come just 
13 kilometers as the crow flies, can the weather be so different? Well, here's a satellite view of the Lake District showing Waswater there and Great Langdale, the other side of the mountain range. The dominant southwesterlies that day were blowing warm, saturated air towards the mountains. When the air met the Scarfell mountain range, the air cooled and caused precipitation over Westwater. This is called orographic rainfall. Great Langdale to the east, however, is protected by the Scarfell range and so often enjoys clear weather when the wind is from the southwest. So you need a plan. You can't just go rushing off in the vague hope of finding better weather somewhere. You need to be familiar with the terrain and study closely the weather map, particularly the dominant wind direction. Unfortunately, the wind and the weather also move, and so you could find yourself driving around all day in appalling conditions. So maybe there's a better strategy. So instead of driving around like a madman in the rain, you might just decide to come back another day in the hope of better conditions. Although this view of Glencoe in the mist and rain has its own beauty and value, we decided to come back another day. And the next morning, the scene looked completely different with a very different aesthetic. It certainly made one photographer I know very happy. You remember Westwater under that low pressure system that Robin just described? Well, we did go back there a few days later and got a very different image. What a difference. But it often takes a day or two for a weather system to change. We have a rule now that we will stay in a location for three nights to improve our odds of getting the weather and light we seek. Here we are at Keswick, looking across the Derwent water to Catbells. Whilst it's a nice composition, the rain across the mountains and the island rather flatten the image and give it a lifeless feel. So back at dawn on another day. Although there is still plenty of atmosphere and depth caused by the fog, the sunlight and perfectly calm lake add a welcome improvement to an already beautiful place. I guess this is what we consider perfect weather. We always apply the Goldilocks principle, not too rainy, but not too much blue sky and sunshine either. Picky, aren't we? What we seek out is those elusive edges of the weather, Ansel Adams passing storm. Still in the English Lake District, which by the way is famous for rain, <laughs> receiving up to five metres of rain a year, this is Blee Tarn with the mountains of Langdale Pikes in the background. This absolutely exemplified the strategy of come back another day for us. We came back not once, not twice, but seven days running in order to avoid the rain, wind, etc. Eventually, thank goodness, on the seventh day, we were treated to this very special reward for all the hard work of the previous six days. The composition was always there, but we had to come back time and time again until the weather and light delivered our vision for the image. I guess it's central to the landscape photographer's insecurity. Do we just record nature's beauty or do we celebrate that beauty with the addition of careful composition, selection of lighting conditions, technical interpretation, and execution. But for many photographers, there may not be the opportunity to keep revisiting a location. And so then you have to employ the next strategy, get out there anyway. With a bit of preparation, skill, and dogged tenacity, it is absolutely possible to make interesting work in bad weather. Here Robin is at uh, Swanage Old Pier in Dorset where he has chosen to use a long exposure technique to blur away the rain on the water and make an image like a zen-like simplicity. And here at the same location, but on the contemporary pier right next door. One of the great advantages to photography in the rain is that you are likely to be alone at locations that are normally heaving with people. That's certainly true for this truly magical place on the Isle of Skye which is normally overrun with modern mystics and selfie takers, a really heavy rainstorm, and we had the place to ourselves. 
Did I say preparation, skill and dogged tenacity? <laughs> well, here we are in the middle of summer, enjoying the challenge of photographing the Blue Lagoon in Iceland. Only for the brave and tenacious, this was a truly scary evening in the Valdorcia, Tuscany. The stormy weather was truly biblical. Horrendous rain, black skies, thunder and hundreds of lightning strikes. Only by being out there did Robin get the shot. The Antrim coast of Northern Ireland just after the storm. The use of a polarizer delivered colour and detail in the wet rocks, whilst at the same time lengthening the exposure to provide shape and movement to the water. Minutes earlier, it was pouring. Loch Tummel in Perthshire, Scotland, the so-called Queen's View. Apparently, Queen Victoria's favourite viewpoint in Scotland. A brief shaft of, light, of sunlight against the stormy skies was only possible because we were out there already. You don't get images like these by waiting in the hotel. Again, on the edges of the weather, we had been out all day photographing in the rain in Tuscany. Suddenly, the clouds opened and shafts of light lit up the fields of wildflowers. These changes in light occur very quickly and disappear equally quickly. You need to be out there in the landscape. A steady climb up Lochnick fell in spring showers enabled this beautiful panorama of the town below with Langdale Pikes at Coniston Water in the distance. Another beautiful summer's day in Iceland. Minutes later, we were in the middle of a torrential downpour. 8 p.m. on a very stormy night in Tuscany and everyone else is safely tucked up in the restaurants of Pienza having dinner. But not us. We're out there working the rain. We always book self-catering accommodation so that we can come and go and eat when it suits us. It's not just about getting out there. You actually have to stay out there. The Isle of Skye is notorious for rain, especially when we're there. But what a treat to get this kind of light. This was literally a three minute gap in the weather. Vic in Iceland on the left and Glencoe in Scotland. It's amazing what results you can actually get in the rain. A day in the gorgeous botanic gardens of Ljubljana. And of course, it poured all day. But with a bit of perseverance, you can always get something interesting. You'd barely know it was absolutely teeming down, especially shooting macro. Obviously, you take cover where you can, especially if it allows you access to interesting images. Hiding away on this veranda in the Julian Alps enabled us to stay dry whilst shooting the dramatic changes during a passing rainstorm. Or the village of Luce in another light. Sometimes you just have to sit it out and wait for the rain to pass. Robin, there, a tiny little person there, stood out in the freezing sleet for absolutely ages waiting for the right light, which thankfully eventually materialised. He gets very, very grumpy when nature doesn't cooperate. I can't tell you how many hours we've spent sitting in soggy locations waiting for the rain to stop. Here we are at the top of the old man of store. After several hours, things still didn't look encouraging. We decided to give it an hour longer and we're just packing up to start the long trek down the mountain when things started to open up nicely. But it's not always like that. This was a fabulous location in the Dolomites that Robin had identified through his research. We did the two hour climb into the foothills, but the weather was not great. We sat it out until nearly nightfall, but nothing improved. So we did what the wounds recommend and came back another day and sat it all out again for hours in the pouring rain. If anything, it was much worse than the previous attempt. Sitting it out indoors in your accommodation is not a good strategy. Watching the rain fall on the phone can be very depressing. And if it changes for the better, you're not in a position to take advantage of it. So, gearing up. There is some equipment that will help you with braving the elements. 
the golden rule is start with yourself. If you're not warm and dry, you won't stay out or indeed have the right frame of mind to make good work. You need a good quality waterproof jacket with big accessible pockets for lenses, filters and microfiber cloths. We highly recommend Gore-Tex fabric, but there are other alternatives. This needs to be coupled with waterproof trousers or over trousers and waterproof boots. And make sure your jacket falls well below your bottom. Then you need to protect your camera, lenses and filters. And a few simple accessories will help enormously. Now, it may seem silly, but if you know that you're going to be working in the wet, it might be sensible to take along a waterproof camera. Uh, they usually have a 35 millimeter wide angle lens, and so they're perfect for landscape work. And they are surprisingly versatile. They even have macro capabilities. We own both the Pentax and Olympus models and highly recommend either. Waterproof covers for cameras range from the sublime to the ridiculous. It may be as simple as a plastic food bag or a shower cap with a rubber band, or the very cheap but very excellent Optech raincoat. These are very thin and pack away to nothing, so we always carry several of these. Or they could be as complicated and ex expensive as the think tank hydrophobia which we actually own but frankly never use it suffers from some serious problems your hands get wet you see and then when you insert them into those side pieces you basically just take your wet into the dry vestibule containing the camera uh, and then everything promptly mis mists up and the plastic is also you know really stiff and awkward to use so can't recommend those. I currently use a camouflaged lens coat product, which is just a simple waterproof tube long enough to cover the entire lens and camera and allows completely free access to the back screen. Whilst uh, Gigi uses a very similar product, but it's in all black material from a company called Photosharp. The humble lens hood can be very useful, especially for longer focal length lenses. Gigi usually has one fitted to her zoom lens, whereas I often work with wide angle lenses and large glass filters where lens hoods become impractical. These large glass filters are very difficult to use in the wet. Every tiny spot of rain gets magnified and recorded by the wide angle lens, particularly if you're working, you know, well stopped down F16 or something. They need constant wiping. I mean, it's a nightmare to try and remove this stuff in Photoshop. It's just impossible. So what I usually do is um, hold a, a cloth right over that. You know, I wipe the filter and then I hold a cloth right up onto the filter until the very moment that I want to open the shutter. And then I release the shutter re and remove the cloth. So these microfiber cloths are absolutely essential. They're very cheap. You need to get lots of them. Um, what we do is start with a, a dry pile in our left-hand coat pocket. And then once they're soaked, we transfer them to the right-hand pocket, um, you know, so that you don't can constantly use a wet one for wiping back your filters it's counterproductive also another little tip don't don't use them straight from the store you know in australia don't just go and buy them from buddings and use them you need to wash them in plain water before you use them otherwise you actually finish up smearing your lens or your filters with all kinds of contaminants we also have two large microfiber uh, travel towels that you'll see Gigi's modeling here for you. <laughs> um, we use those regularly to dry ourselves off, uh, but also just to dry off the cameras and things before we put them back in bags. Gigi also regularly carries a large uh, black garbage bag uh, to put gear into or to lie on uh, where it's wet. <clears throat> now, Everyone has their own ideas about tripods. 
G hates them. I love them. One thing is certain that if you're going to want to work in the dark and stormy weather, you're going to need a tripod. This is not the place to give advice on which tripod to use. That's for another day. But one feature you might want to check out because it absolutely caught me out is are the legs watertight or do they drain easily? I found to my absolute horror that my very expensive new Gitzo uh, sucked in water and then wouldn't let it go. So the legs were full of water for weeks. <clears throat> when you're working with a tripod on soggy land, you might want to consider a couple of useful little tripod accessories. Long spikes for the tripod legs are particularly useful on the bouncy undergrowth of woodland. And when working on soft uh, but even surfaces like sand in the rain, we recommend leg shoes for your tripod. But actually, these days, I just carry three old CDs. They're brilliant. They've got a <laughs> hole in the middle that take the spikes on the end of the tripod. Um, they're completely lightweight. They spread the load in exactly the same way as these very expensive uh, accessories. So they're very effective and they're dead easy to pack. They weigh nothing and they're as flat as. So just get yourself three old CDs and stick your tripod legs into the holes in the middle. It's a great little trick. Camera bags are also very personal things. So I'm not going to make recommendations except uh, to say, make sure it's waterproof. Uh, I must say, we, I mean, we've got loads of bags and we don't actually know of any that, that are waterproof. And the material itself usually gets soaked fairly quickly and the zips all tend to leak. So make sure that you buy one with a fully waterproof cover that stretches over the whole backpack. Even then, you've got to think about how are you actually going to take the gear out and, for example, change lenses in the pouring rain. It's really best, if you can, to pre-select the camera and lens that you're going to be using, along with their covers, and leave the backpack in the car, quite frankly. Don't forget the humble umbrella. A small folding umbrella fits easily on the side of the camera bag, and it's just big enough to protect you and the camera. Just be aware about large umbrellas. I know some people recommend golfing umbrellas, but actually they're really difficult to hold whilst you're holding a camera, uh, especially if there's any wind blowing at all. They're a bit of a nightmare. Probably the most important part of your gear for rainy weather <clears throat> is a polarizer. It's the one filter that can't be replaced by post capture processing. And its ability to remove reflections on, on foliage makes it immensely useful for landscape photography in the rain. It significantly increases the colour depth by removing all of the silvery white reflections on the wet surfaces. With full polarisation, the image will then look a little flat and you'll need to increase the contrast in post-capture processing. The polarizer works really well on all landscape surfaces, not just leaves, giving beautiful color depth, even in the pouring rain. This is in Glencoe, and it was absolutely heaving down with rain at the time. The only thing to bear in mind, of course, is that you are going to lose some light when you're fully polarized, and you'll probably be already working in very low light conditions. Now, Provided you've got a signal on your mobile phone, which often we don't have in remote conditions, there are a couple of um, apps that are you know, very helpful in trying to assess the potential of any location. The first is, of course, a decent weather app. We routinely use a service from Norway called YR, which does seem pretty accurate all over the world. I mean, no, no weather app is totally uh, accurate uh, but YR seems pretty good we've used it um, on most continents very successfully the second one on the right hand side um, is, a, is a terrific app it was actually built for astronomers and it's called clear outside and this gives really helpful information about cloud cover at different heights 
as well as predictions of fog and rain. And both of these work anywhere in the world. Within Australia, there are two fantastic apps. Uh, one's called Rain Parrot, which we think gives really accurate assessments of expected rainfall. And Windy, which gives very detailed information about wind speeds and directions. And I'm, I'm told that they're working on international versions of both of these. So you'd be able to travel pretty well anywhere with them. So the third section of our talk then relates to particular subjects or techniques that are useful for photography in the wet, and we'll take you through these individually. The first thing you might like to try is photographing the rain itself. With a fast enough shutter speed, you can even get some interesting Edgerton type photographs. Or you can get creative, photograph rain running down the windows or abstract effects. Photographing the rain itself doesn't just mean raindrops, of course. It could be an image of a rainstorm. Sometimes rain fronts can be truly sublime, frightening and quite spectacular. This one was in Edifal, just right out the front of us. Instead of hiding from the rain, get out and photograph it. Emphasise the rain. When we went to photograph Uluru, or Ayers Rock, in the arid red centre of Australia, it was of course raining. I mean, what else would it be? So we did the only thing we could, photograph the rain on the rock. It was actually a truly beautiful sight. All that white is water running off the rock. Use a slow shutter speed and the rain blurs out. You'd never know it was raining. So amazing. Rain on the rock used to be a truly rare event and very few people had experienced it but with changing weather patterns as a result of climate change, it is becoming a common sight. And even tonight on the news, we saw that the um, rock is absolutely heaving with water cascading down its sides. Absolutely fabulous. So what do you do when you arrive in Venice, the city of your dreams for a week's photography? And this is the forecast. Rain every day. It is just so depressing to see that, honestly. Well, you gear up for it and you get out there and you emphasise the rain. Don't be put off by the rain, make a feature of it. Make the rain central to the image's composition and narrative. The rain just might be the thing that brings cohesion to a series of images. So we spent the rain, it's the, went the week, concentrating on the rain. Who's, is it? Who's just the rain there? only adds to the romance of the place. In some cultures, it's considered a blessing when it rains on your wedding, and this couple of hopeless romantics seem completely okay with getting soaked, the soft colour palette lending a melancholic feel to the image. This little girl found a torrent of rain to stand under, and she really was singing in the rain. Gondolas in the rain. This is Robin's photo. It's not nearly as easy as it looks. I just couldn't get it to work for me at all. I just could not get that effect of freezing the rain coming down. But he did. I wonder how many punk shows they sell. A long exposure to give the sense of the thousands of bobbing umbrellas. Hey, when have you ever seen St Mark's Square completely empty? <laughs> Emphasising the rain creates whole new opportunities. Trees, woods and forests can be especially beautiful in the rain. So head for the woods, but put that polarizer on first. Woodlands are perfect subjects in the rain, especially combined with running water. Olympic National Park in the Pacific Northwest. But of course, it's raining. This was a horrendous day in the Forest of Dean, but it's surprising what you can pull out of the bag. Mm. We love this wood in Wales, totally covered in moss and ferns, like something out of Tolkien. But getting around wasn't easy. In fact, this must have been one of the worst shoots I've ever been on. It was so dark, I had to use my tripod, which you know I absolutely hate doing, and I was slipping around all over the place because of the mud. 
And in the end, in the end, I just hardly took anything. I just absolutely hated it because I just couldn't control anything really. Oh, by the way, this is what those woods looked like without a polarizer, as dull as ditch water, really. Another spooky Middle Earth woodland, Wistman's Wood in Devon. Ancient oaks twisted by the ferocious winds. We photographed here in constant heavy rain. Another great strategy for working in the rain is to concentrate on close-ups or macro, uh, what these days is often called the intimate landscape. Mm. These subjects can be surprisingly successful in the wet. In fact, the raindrops really help to tell the story of autumn here. Staghorn lichen in the rain. This was in Iceland uh, when it was absolutely dreadful weather in the summer, of course, I should point out. Now, here's an example where you don't want to use the polarizer. The wet reflections really make this image. So you don't want a polarizer killing that off. The other obvious subject for rainy day photography is, of course, the waterfall. You want the water from the rain to swell the river's flow, but you also want the low contrast lighting that inevitably comes with a rainy day. From New Hampshire on the left to Snowdonia on the right, waterfalls almost always look better in overcast, soft, rainy weather. And it's not just waterfalls in woodland either. This is Kirkjufell's Foss in Western Iceland in the summer. A very heavy storm over the Black Coolin as a background to Glenbrittle Falls on the Isle of Skye. What about this spectacular one on the Antrim coast of Northern Ireland, where in heavy rain, the water seems to emerge straight out of the grass and then crash down into the sea. Another thing you might like to try in the rain is the use of long exposures and intentional camera movement. I love experimenting despite the weather. Here is we've got the combination of rain and ICM in a Scottish woodland, giving sort of a painterly effect. The Isle of Harris and the Outer Hebrides. It always rains there. It really wasn't us. But I had been hoping for bright turquoise colours. Instead, we had rain, of course, but they're quite nice muted tones. You can use puddles to great effect to create reflections of your subject. Just be aware that you are probably going to get very wet because you're going to need to be pretty low down. You'll really have to look out for this type of image as they are not obvious from a normal height. I have an advantage over that, as I'm shorter than everybody else. So. <laughs> Many rocks look very ordinary when dry, but become very colourful when wet, particularly when you remove the surface reflections with the polarizer. The ochre pits in Central Australia, after heavy rains, look absolutely amazing. That's ochre, can you? Oh. We even know of one photographer in Port Hedland who paid the local fire brigade to drive out to a rock feature and soak it prior to photography. <laughs> <laughs> These gorgeous pebbles on the beach at Delbeg in the Outer Hebrides looked bland when we arrived in the dry, but our personal rain cloud that follows us everywhere soon drenched them, dramatically improving their colours and patterns. The same was true for these rocks on the beach at Huisinus. Turberwith Cove in Cornwall. When dry, these rocks had similar tonalities, but in the rain with the polarizer, they really have terrific color contrast. The other, another subject that um, you can photograph quite successfully in the rain is actually wildlife. You know, animals, generally speaking, don't mind being out in the rain. They're not like us. And they're often more approachable when the rain brings them down off the higher hills. 
this gorgeous little seal pup doesn't even know it's raining. I mean, he spends most of his life in and out of the water, so he doesn't notice. Gigi even managed this beautifully composed image of a robin whilst we were trying to capture Wisman's wood that you saw earlier in the pouring rain. And I, I do mean pouring. It was horrendous. I don't know. That's that's what you call being flexible. I, I wish I could do that. I, Gigi's incredible at doing this stuff. Dry deserts become an absolute riot of colour after a jolly good dose of rain. So, you know, it, get out there. And the rainy season in the Western McDonald Ranges brings out literally thousands of birds, including huge flocks of budgerigar and this rather beautiful but vulnerable and rarely seen princess parrot. Princess. One of the most spectacular but difficult to photograph phenomena associated with rainfall is, of course, the rainbow. The reason why it's difficult is that it's usually hard to find a composition with the rainbow in a suitable position. The angle and location of the rainbow is, of course, set by the angle of the sun. And chasing around to try and move the rainbow in your image inevitably changes your foreground. Uh, so, and often by the time you find something that kind of works compositionally, the rainbow, you know, the rain has blown over and the rainbow has disappeared. <clears throat> Here in Patagonia, we had the composition all lined up and then magically our dedicated rain cloud blew in and gave us the most perfect rainbow shot. Sometimes it's much better to home in on a part of the rainbow, as here in this photograph at Wilson's Prom, rather than trying to capture the whole arc of the rainbow. The same technique here in Tuscany, with just a partial rainbow. It, it's incredible, actually, if you look at it, it's as if the rainbow is lighting up all of the rain to its left. But, you know, when you look at it afterwards, don't you just wish... You could, you could just nudge that rainbow just over a little bit so that it was perfectly on the farm. <laughs> the combination of rainfall and sunset can be absolutely magical, the red and the rain. To borrow a line from an Adele song, set fire to the rain. Golden hour glow with a dramatic rainstorm. Biblical light absolutely fantastic it's spine tingling when you get this kind of light this is what landscape photography is all about rain and the last light on Blencathra in Cumberland wet pavement acting as reflectors at the Burren in County Clare in Ireland Now, if you're not exhausted by too many sunrise shoots, you can always get out at night, in the rain, of course. Mm. In fact, towns look particularly good in the wet with street lights and shop windows and so on. Here you can see on the left, the Sacre Coeur, and on the right, the town of Pienza. And here is St. Mark's Square during the famous Aqua Alta, when the high tides and heavy rainfall cause all the canals to flood and St Mark's Square becomes a gigantic lake. <laughs> Obviously, reflections are great at night. The last thing to bear in mind with your rainy day photographs is that they might require some post-capture processing. Images taken in the rain usually look very dull and lack contrast. This is particularly the case when using a polarizer to remove surface reflections. So we, routine, we, we routinely restore the contrast with a curves adjustment layer. The other technique that is especially effective for those dull rainy pics is to convert them to monochrome. Here I am working at Dirtle Dor Dorset in the pouring rain <laughs> and the converted vinyl image. 
the Kelpies, 30 metre high statues at Falkirk in Scotland. In the pouring rain again, of course. But they look very dramatic in monochrome. You can't just use this technique to rescue rainy day images though. You have to give proper consideration to the nature of the subject and its tones and composition. These black houses on Lewis in the Outer Hebrides lacked contrast and the stormy conditions just begged for a dramatic conversion. The same here at the Cot in Cornwall. A lovely scene, but it needed drama in my opinion. And this was added by converting to monochrome. This storm passing over Eastern Harris had a lovely quality, but lacked the sense of drama that we experienced when we were there. So a black and white conversion felt appropriate. Well, we hope that we've given you a fresh appreciation for rainy days with some helpful strategies, subjects and techniques for the next time that you find yourself out with your camera in the rain. Now, you'd like to think that after all that activity in the rain, we'd be off home to celebrate with a nice glass of red. But no, it's drying out all the clothes mm -hmm. without access to a clothes dryer <laughs> so that we can go out into the rain again, inevitably, the next day. And if you can't face the prospect of getting sopping wet for a grey photograph, there's always one more strategy. You can take Annie's advice and wait until tomorrow because the sun is always sure to come out tomorrow, tomorrow. Well, now before you all fall asleep, we'd be happy to answer any questions or discuss any ideas that you have about um, weather and photography in adverse conditions. So thank you very much. I'll stop sharing our screen now. There we go. That should be happening. Yeah. There we go. So, any comments, thoughts, or questions? Overwhelmed. Yeah. <laughs> it's too wet. You see, you didn't bring your umbrellas. Should have bought your umbrellas. Yeah. There was a, one of the rain hoods that you mentioned on the way through was that one that was just like clear plastic. Yeah. It was followed immediately by the black one. What yeah. Was the clear what was the clear one the, called? The, the clear one is absolutely brilliant, Brian. It's it's by a, a an American company, Optech. So O P T E C H, and you'll get them in, in, in pretty much any decent, you know, camera store. Okay. Um, and they're they're dirt cheap, you know, they're like uh, Fifteen dollars or something. Yeah. Um, so it, it, you know, it's a glorified plastic bag that's been yeah. heat sealed in the shape of a camera, and it's pretty generous. So it allows most lenses, you know, to to accommodate most lenses. Now it's not very robust, so you know, pulling it in and out of the uh, backpack or whatever, you know, that it'll develop rips or whatever. But to be honest, I mean, you know, they weigh so little, it collapses to nothing and it, it's dirt cheap. And you can get one that accommodates a flash Yeah, you can as even well. get one with that, that has a little tunnel on the top to put a flash, you know, if you've got a flash on camera. So very cheap, very effective. I've you got don't... one of those, I've got one of those um, ones that you mentioned later that, and I just, the brand escapes me for the minute, but you, you said, you know, when you put your hands inside it, you're going yeah. to be wet. Hopeless. I just found that to be absolutely really cumbersome and, and um, yeah. Whoever, whoever designed that should get the, you know, the design whatever award, you know. I mean, really, it's supposed to be, supposed to be a watertight enclosure, but what do you have to do? You put you put your wet hands inside through two yeah. sleeves to operate the camera. Brilliant design. Yeah. And it's really expensive. I don't know what yours costs, Brian. But yeah, I mean, it costs a lot of money. It absolutely costs a lot of money. So please don't waste your money on one of those. Was it Think Tank? That's it, Think Tank, yeah. yeah. Well, there's a couple of makes, actually, but Think Tank is one of them. Same yeah. sort of design. They're absolutely okay. useless. There's a lot of people swear by... Um, you know, shower caps, 
that you get yeah. in your hotel. You know, you, you you know how they give you your little cosmetics and yeah. whatever, you know, in the hotel room, and one of them is a shower cap. Well, it's basically a plastic bag with an elastic band around it, and yeah. you know, in a in, in a in a tight spot when you've forgotten to put your optic in or something, just grab the shower cap. It'll work. You know, it'll work once for a while. Yeah. And I and I really appreciate the, the the tip on the polarizer. Yeah. It just as soon as I saw that and I thought back to a range of photos I was taking in the forest in Japan, and I've never been able to get them to work. No. To no. Light them. And if I, yeah, if I'd had a polarizer, yeah. it, would, it made all the distance. So thanks for that. And and you know you kind of, it is one of those things you just can't rescue. You know, it's yeah. unlike you know, if you've got sky that's a bit too bright or whatever, you can you can do most things in Lightroom Photoshop. You know, changing um, tones and colors and color balance, all that stuff. The one thing you cannot do is change the polarized light off of all those wet surfaces, yeah. and that's what ruins most rainy day pictures. You know, they just look horrid, jet black shadows mm. and silvery white reflections. Yeah. You yeah. put your polarizer on and you go, oh, my God, that's fantastic. Yeah. You know, um, but almost almost always, you might argue with me, but almost always needs, you know, you've got to be working off a tripod yeah, you because you're working in a woodland, it's dark, you want the depth of field. The polarizer takes a whack of light off that as well, you know. So it's pretty much a tripod only venture, but well, well worth doing. Okay, so I use a polarizer a lot, and the one thing I'll say is I've learned. Um, I used to buy the like the good quality, but not the top level. Yeah, they keep getting scratched. Yep. Yeah, they do. So I you buy the the very most expensive one. And you can just wipe, wipe them with a cloth and whatever. They just keep on going and going, and the marks are removed. Yeah. Right. So, I've, I've got a cupboard full of old polarizers here. Yeah. They're all scratched out in the field, and I can't bring myself to throw them away because they're so <laughs> expensive. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping one day I'll find a use for them. I did. I did actually use them once. I put a pair over some flash guns when I was trying to do cross polarized. Uh, flash on some macro work so sometimes they'll come in useful but but yeah no it does it pays the other thing is when you buy those really uh, top quality ones they are multi-coated you yeah. know on the front surface and that makes it these days those coatings are very good and very sophisticated so you know the rain the rain doesn't wash off them which is sort of what they claim but it, they're a lot easier to keep exactly. dry yep. with your dry cloth. Yeah, we do a lot of bushwalking, and um, I can't go and like leave the cameras in the car. Kept them in the camera bag, and what I've done is it's got a rain cover. Yep. Well, what I also did was I sewed a liner inside it. Yeah. It goes around the top, and then there's a plastic bag goes between that liner and the bag. Yeah, so yeah. the bag slowly gets wet and pouring rain. You, you wear yeah, it. Yeah, that's yeah. that's what yeah. she uses her uh, inside plastic, so bag, uh, plastic yeah. bag for is to keep the gear dry. You can, I mean, I we did experiment when we were we were doing some work in Canada and and from kayaks, and so we did use. Um, you can get proper kayaking uh, water, you know, waterproof bags. Where you roll you roll the top down and seal them with Velcro, but so yeah, it keeps your gear dry. But it's <laughs> you know it's impossible. It's impossible to access the gear. You know, so yeah, yeah. it's uh, it's always a compromise between accessibility and keeping the gear dry. And don't believe anyone that tells you that their camera is water. Well, I mean. If it is a waterproof camera and a Konus or something, that's fine. But most DSLR and mirrorless say, oh, yes, it's IP7, IP5, whatever, you know, all these claims about, oh, yeah, you want a really big repair bill? I can tell you how to get one. <laughs> they are not. You know, the outer surfaces of the plastic are water repellent. But, you know, the lens seals and all that stuff, 
you, you've only got to be out in the rain for 15 minutes and you're in big trouble. That old man of store, we had Gore-Tex coats on and we were drenched on yeah, the we were, we, two we, hours Yeah, we two sat hours for back. two hours on the top of the old man of store on Sky um, in the pouring rain. And good quality Gore-Tex, you know, it certainly wasn't which, working, which has it? a reputation <laughs> and has been tested to be very, very waterproof. By the time that it had, you know, that much water on it solidly for two hours, they just became like sponges and we were soaked to the skin. So, you know, waterproof is a funny sort of concept. Mm. And certainly in terms of clothing, if it is waterproof, it's going to be waterproof both sides. So you're going to sweat like hell when you're climbing up the mountains. <laughs> so, you know, it's um, it's always a compromise, isn't it? You know, you've got to sort of work out that compromise. And, and even Gore-Tex, um, if it's really wet on the outside, it works on a humidity and um, temperature differential. Yeah. And what happens is wet on the outside, well, the vapour can't pass through the pot. That's right. Because the outside's soaking wet. Yeah, where do you get condensation in them anyway? Um, I, I, I mean, you will laugh because hers was working reasonably well. I don't know why it was. There must have been a, I magic, think because I had a magic bit of a so many layers no of clothing on underneath it didn't reach me. Um, <laughs> we, we got down to the bottom of the car park, and I took my boots off, which are hot, you know, high ankle boots, so that so I wasn't walking in water. But when I took my boots off, I emptied out all the water, and that was all coming down that inside oh. of waterproofs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. So, you, know. you know the other trick with your Gore-Tex? Um, every two or three years, oh, iron, yeah, machine. not with Sorry. the super hot, but mild iron, it actually resets the cloth. Yeah, yeah. So we, we, we did mine. that, though. But I, it, we use... It, um, um, I think, it, you know, yours is quite old. Mine's just, old now. Well, but, they're old, they leak anyway. Yeah. 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 But, yeah, um, right? yeah, we wash them in Nix wax, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, wash, and then pop them in the in the clothes dryer, and it actually does. They come up like new, really. Yeah, but, but what you should do after the nick wax, um, then wash it again just with water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All yeah. traces of the of the of, um, of the actual uh, product. Yeah. yeah. And then iron. Can you spell out that name? I I've worked it. in the outdoor field for many it, years. So. Yeah, it's yeah. Nix N I X yeah. hyphen wax. W-A-X, and they make a whole range of product for cleaning and um, renovating the waterproofing uh, mm. on things like Gore-Tex. I mean, there, there's more than Gore-Tex. There are lots of other alternatives to Gore-Tex these days. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Getting back. I, I've been in about all those uh, situations that you mentioned, um, particularly when I was in... Uh, England and the house steads on uh, Trojan's wall and we got, suddenly had this rainstorm come over and everybody's hugging up against the walls <laughs> and you're hiding in from the rain. On top of that, when we were in Ireland, uh, I was photographing uh, Ben Nevis mm -hmm. and uh, while I was taking a picture of it in the sun, the rain was soaking me on my back. Yeah, yeah. And one other weather problem there is if you go to the Cliffs of Moa, you have to be sure what the wind is like. Yeah. Yeah. First, first time I arrived, you couldn't stand up. Oh, you know, no. We're actually knocking you over. I don't think we got a photo there, did we? The, no, we didn't. Uh, well, no. to be honest, it wasn't the wind. I, that was a case of coming back the next day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, next year. <laughs> I couldn't find a composition to make it work, but the wind was hell. And I, I, I have a have a look on if you ever do look on these things. Have a look on YouTube for Cliff Samar, right? And you will see a YouTube of somebody running a photographic workshop on all, along the cliffs. And the leader, I, I won't name him, but the leader of the workshop puts his camera bag down fairly close to the edge of the cliffs mm -hmm. and opens it up and starts to get some gear out. And then he turns around to talk to, you know, the other people about what they're going to do and what angle they're going to do. And this, um, what I can only describe as a, a, a vortex, an absolute vortex of wind came up the cliffs 
and took his camera bag up into the air in this vortex and there's cameras and lenses being flung out of this thing all around. And the whole lot then disappears down. For those of you who don't know it, these are the <laughs> highest cliffs in Ireland. So, the, you know, we, I can't remember how high they are. Perhaps you do. But, they're, you know, they're hundreds of feet high. So everyone's kind of watching all of this gear disappear down the other side of the cliffs. Have, have a look. You'll find it on YouTube if you put photography yeah. gear in the wind on, on the cliffs of Mar. It's, well, it's to know hilarious. That, uh playing golf on that day. Right. He teed off. He hit the ball up and the ball rose up about a foot in front of him and then went backwards. <laughs> he, was further back. he was further back than where he started from. <laughs> so, you, you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's, not, it's uh, not just photographers that suffer. Talking about cameras, though, I will say that the Olympus... Um, pro weather resistant, yeah, drugs yeah, yeah, are a lot better than normal cameras. Yeah, they do. I know I've been in a couple of situations where anything else would have been completely wrecked, yep, and they've soldiered on. Yeah, so the, the lens and camera combination yeah. have to be both, yeah, really pro quality. But uh, if it is, they, they, I won't say they will I... withstand everything, but they. Haven't done no, badly by me so far. They're yeah. pretty good, and they're built like a tank. Yeah. I I had one of the original Olympus um, Muse, you know, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. which were the very first ones of the waterproofs. And well, actually, I've still got it. Oh, I've still got a tough little yeah. tank and, too, but yeah, these are absolutely cool tough as hell. And yeah. you know, they've you know in adverts and things, they've driven huge trucks over them, and no damage at all. I mean, they're really. Yeah built like a tank but uh, but they're ideal you know the focal length of the lens is good for but for landscape and for landscape. you know they're really terrific and the modern versions have got little focusing lights in for macro and you know they're quite good hmm. really but you know it it's obviously you just got you're working with a fixed focal length and all that stuff but um if you know you're going to be working in adverse environments, I mean, I, I remember doing a job as a scientific photographer where, you know, we knew the camera was just going to get absolutely hammered with water. Um, and, in fact, we, we used a, uh, a mew to do that, to, to do that, because it was tough as old boots and it didn't matter if it had to be thrown away. The other thing that... Um... With, with the quality of, of the uh, photography and, and the latest cameras, um, I've got the, the, the new Pixel, and I've actually bought a Pelican weather, weatherproof, waterproof um, pouch. Yeah. Which I can put under the water. Yeah. And, um, you know, for just basic sort of snapshot type things, um, yeah. you know, they're really handy. Yeah. What percentage of Film to digital with a, with what you show tonight. Um, I think I'm right in saying yes, yeah, hundred percent digital. No, yeah, hundred percent digital. I'm the other way. I'm hundred percent film. <laughs> oh, that's okay. It doesn't matter how you doesn't matter how you record the image. It's uh, it's conceptualizing no, it's, it's it. It's not that. It's what you can do with it when you get it back. And secondly, yeah. the number, the speed of the film that you've got at the time and yeah. the, the restriction of how many frames you've got on we that remember. film. That you're <laughs> I remember. We remember. I remember it well. <laughs> we remember taking all those films overseas in the X-ray bags and you yeah, take yeah. back 20 film, rolls of film, couldn't you? Uh, we were saying the other day we'd just... Okay. We you just been on it. You, got. you don't know what you got till you get the film. Oh, from. terrible. Oh, no, yeah. thing, you know. But we used to, you know, we had a a a, a big um, Tamrac uh, hold all bag, and it was only the little middle section that had cameras and lenses. The two ends were bricks of film. You know, <laughs> we, we would travel with two hundred rolls of Kodachrome. Huh. It's um, crazy. Whereas now, you know. One one little XD car, you know, <laughs> does does more than that, a lot more. 
the heavy right. bits of the, the spare batteries, though, that you need for digital. Yeah. <laughs> and that's not too bad, really. Depends. Hey. But if, if you're mirrorless, you'll eat oh, up batteries. But... Uh, Olympus don't, batteries don't last as long as some of the other brands. No, no, well, they're very tiny. They've got very little storage capacity. Yeah, but I... uh, equally... And, and the fact that you have to carry them in hand luggage because the yeah. Yeah. phones don't like them. Yeah. But, um, you, you try travelling with a decent-sized drone. Mm. <laughs> no, I haven't. No, I don't, I don't well, you can, you can check the drone in. That's not a problem. Okay. But, but the batteries, batteries yeah. are big. And, you know, if you – so your flight, flight time on a – typical drone is you know 30 minutes if you're lucky um and so to do anything you know remotely suitable like to fly out reconnoiter something work out a shot get back out there and take it you know you're going to need three or four batteries and they're big and they're heavy mm. and they cause all kinds of consternation with airport um, yeah. security so you've got to carry them on your person Yes. So their view is, you know, if it's going to catch fire, they want you to burn with it. So <laughs> yes. you have to put it in your pockets. Um, so oh, they're, you know, so know. batteries, batteries are still mm. a, a, a problem. In the backpack, but... <laughs> yeah, well, that backpack is getting heavier and heavier. <laughs> Mine is anyway. It's, it's <laughs> like it's like school backpacks. You know, the yeah. theory the theory was when the kids had a laptop that you know their back. Pack would be nothing. It'd be just a little laptop sleeve. Well, <laughs> have you seen any of the kids on the on the train lately? Gee whiz, nothing has talking changed. about tragedies with film and uh, photography. I uh, went up to uh, a particular uh, cliff face uh, just north of Sydney, and I wanted to get some pictures of the waves breaking over the rocks. Yeah. So I found I found a, an area which had a slope on it, so I could get underneath there and I could look down uh, on on the, the rocks below. Yeah. And uh, I took a few shots with a fifty mil lens, and I thought I want to get a close up on one of them where it's really surging as it comes up over there. So I just stepped back, uh, got my camera, and. Uh, held it in a hand like this, I wanted to change the lens, so I took the lens out, put that down here, and all of a sudden I heard this roar, and this wave came down on top of me, went straight down inside the camera, oh, and I threw out the whole lot of it, and there I was having a soak camera <laughs> there, and it pushed me back. I actually, with my hand, the way the wave hit me, it knocked me back against the rock, and because I had the finger around there, bang the finger as oh. well. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I was soaked. I was standing there yeah. absolutely yeah. soaked. Lucky you went with a soaked away. <laughs> yeah. It was I, a Ica. I, it was I, a um, Ica. I, I knew, oh, no, really. I knew the Leica agent in Sydney, and this was a Sunday, and uh, <laughs> I rang him up straight away to find out if he was in his office, and he said, yes, I am. So I explained to <laughs> him what had happened, and he said, bring it into the shop straight away. I'm in the shop now. Bring it in, and we'll have to see what we can do. So when I took it in, the first thing he started to do was to dismantle it. Yeah. Now, the thing is, it's easy to dismantle yeah. a camera like that, which was a, a standard. <laughs> and he had all the little pieces laid out, oh, and he said, well, dry it out. The thing was that even some of the fine wires had still started to corrode yeah. with the salt at From that the salt. time. And uh, he, he said, of course, it takes something like two days to put it back together again because you've got to put pieces in, check them, Check it. If it's not right, you take it back out, make the adjustment rule, put the next piece in, and you've got to actually test each piece that you put back together again. So he said, uh, I don't have all the equipment to do that. So he gave me my camera 
Back in the plastic bag. Yeah. <laughs> All the little pieces and everything. Uh, uh, what did you do? <laughs> Took a photo of it. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Uh, be careful at the seaside. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, I think be careful who you give your camera to afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> It wasn't like the old Nikon F3. It was in the manual. <laughs> the, the, the old F3, she got it wet, take the, take the little battery out, and it was salt water, put it in a bucket of fresh water to get rid of all yeah. the salt. Yeah, yeah. Just dry it out, and uh, once it's been dry for a couple of weeks, it'll be fine to use again because everything was sealed <laughs> and it was all titanium. Yeah. yeah. That, was, that, was a, that was, a yeah. I think, the only camera they ever made like that. Mm. Talking about travel on planes, I've I've actually got these bags now. Yeah. All my all my um, batteries into, um, and it's called a lipo safe bag. But they, you know, they just they just open up and you put yeah. your batteries in. And I I I find that they're uh, really good because if you have if one of them does. Catch on fire, that won't burn. No. What was that called, Brian? It's um it's it's li L I dash P O safe bag. It's um I mean there's a lot of um Thank you. Uh, there's a lot of literature on uh, you know the problems with different configurations of lithium batteries. But the and you know I think there's a lot of nonsense talked and the airlines jump on that and so oh. they've got to ensure the safety of all the passengers and so on. Yeah. But in fact, <clears throat> as I understand the statistics, uh, the vast majority, and I mean you know more than ninety eight percent of the incidents of fire on aircraft with lithium batteries have been mobile phones. Right. They've, not, they've not been photographers' batteries or anything like that. They're mobile phones. What happens is people drop them down the side of the seat, then they put the seat back to rest, and it crushes the phone and sets off a particular chemical reaction in the lithium battery that it goes into basically into a meltdown, into a heat meltdown. And because it's next door to the fabric of the seat, you've got a conflagration. So it's um, you know, us poor old photographers get maligned. You know, it's really it's really the it's the smartphones that cause the problem. Although I suppose they're cameras anyway. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things that I did going back a few years when I was heading into Kakadu for a for a couple of weeks was I needed to have a heap of batteries with me because I, I wasn't going to be making um, contact, being able to charge them very often. Mm. So I contacted, I was flying with Qantas, so I contacted Qantas and said, look, this is the issue I've got, laid it out for them, wrote off to them. And they, ca they came back and gave me a letter saying that it was okay with what I was proposing to do. And I told them how I'd protect it, et cetera. Now, I've always kept that letter. <laughs> so when I travel, that's one of the things like a passport. <laughs> you just, just keep updating the date. <laughs> uh, that's good. Uh, good. Good. Well, Elaine, um, are, you, uh, are you looking to wrap up about now? I don't think so. Unless there, are there any other comments, questions? Uh... No. Requests okay. for tutorials. <laughs> oh, well, how can I say thank you adequately for that wonderful presentation? It really was so, when I said overwhelming, you just covered so much, not just how to take photographs in the rain, but the huge range of locations you went to, the wide weather differences that show how superb results can still be obtained and I know everybody here has thoroughly enjoyed it and been inspired by it and uh, you're you're encouraging us all to get out there and, and try to sing in the rain so <laughs> thank you very very much <laughs> everybody yeah, else awesome. join me in saying thank you yeah, thank, thank you. you thank you very much fabulous thank you
Yes, no, I, and I, I'd uh, add mine uh, to that, uh, Zhejin Robin. I, I mean, I thought it, it started out looking like you were only going to be taking photos of it raining in England, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but no, it, it does that all the time. Yeah, so. I was going to say.